Today I'm speaking about environmental governance as exercised at the national level in Canada and internationally. And as you can see from the images on the screen, environmental governance is multifaceted, involving many different actors and processes. And the face of environmental governance is changing rapidly, both in a positive direction but also negatively. Positively, the trends are toward innovative approaches being applied by industry, civil society, Aboriginal groups, and the collaborations among them. But negatively, governments are failing to set policy and progress law on environmental issues and are not meeting their commitments made in the past, both at the national and international levels. By and large, when we look at the state of the environment, particularly in terms of global issues, climate change, biodiversity, we're moving in the wrong direction. The central question here is, you know, how do we govern better for a better society? And why is it that this engagement with government is, is, is starting to fail? Governance, at its most basic, is about decision making. What decisions are made and how they are made. And it's about accountability of those making decisions to their stakeholders, be they citizens, members of organizations or shareholders. And it's also about the relationships among the actors and the agents involved in environmental governance. And ultimately, governance is about exercise of power in decision making. Environmental governance is about how societies see the environment and how key actors take decisions that affect the environment. It involves the functions, structures and processes for decision making and the discharge of accountabilities by organizations at all levels of society, international, regional, national, subnational, local and community, but always in the interest of the environment and in the context of other societal objectives, social, cultural and economic. Today, environmental governance has moved beyond the realm of government responsibility and action alone to encompass direct accountability and actions taken by Aboriginal groups, business, communities, not-for-profit organizations, and citizens themselves. Today, I present four forms of environmental governance, three of these exercised at the national level and one at the international level. These are, first, government measures, normally policy, law, and the range of instruments used to give them effect and how environmental law in Canada is weakening today. Second, industry voluntary action for the environment and increasingly also address social issues through industry standards and performance improvement initiatives. Third mode is collaboration across sectors of society and in particular civil society as represented by non-governmental organizations working directly and also in collaboration with industry and other partners. And fourth is international decision-making processes for environment and sustainable development through the series of Rio summits as an example and also through the increasing failure to make progress through international environmental negotiations. For each of these I explore the substantive outcomes do such processes and measures lead to real environmental improvement and the process of governance themselves with an emphasis on the involvement of external stakeholders. The risks that I see when we don't do consultation well, a couple of them are very obvious. If government is making decisions without the active input of civil society and industry, it risks making the wrong policy choices. It's acting on incomplete information, both technical and of interest, and we risk having badly formulated policy. Today, at the national level, we're seeing a lack of environmental policy and a weakening of environmental laws and regulations but it hasn't always been that way. Let me compare and contrast policy efforts on climate change and specifically mitigation or reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada in 2002 and today in 2012. Between 1998 and 2002, the federal government worked with the provinces and territories to develop a national plan on climate change, the Climate Change Plan for Canada 2002, to respond to the internationally agreed Kyoto Protocol targets which Canada had set and was in anticipation of signing at that time. Key governance elements of the process put in place at that time was a multi-stakeholder sector table, set of tables for each of the key sectors of the economy, a federal provincial territorial committee on natural resources at the, at the minister's level, an officials coordinating committee involving all jurisdictions in Canada, technical working group called the analysis and modeling group to support the 
ministers and the Assistant Deputy Minister Committee with the job to determine the magnitude of the gap between the growth in emissions under a business as usual scenario in Canada and how to meet the Kyoto target. Substantial environmental and economic analysis was undertaken, including competitiveness analysis, impact on GDP, regional distribution of GHG reductions and attendant economic impacts, impacts at the sector level, and a range of GHG or climate change measures to address different scenarios and adaptation needs. Provincial and national multi-stakeholder consultations, consultations were also a critical part to consider the roll-up of the sector plans and look at GHG measures and a national plan that would be economy-wide and address all the environmental parameters involved. The most important part of this process, other than the final political decision-making, was two years of work done in multi-sector tables. This covered all major economic sectors in Canada, with multi-stakeholder groups working across industry, government, communities, non-governmental groups, academics, researchers. Each table produced an agreed set of emission reduction scenarios for their sector and supporting policy instruments, in many cases designed in sufficient detail that they could be introduced. The buy-in by often competing interests was quite remarkable and demonstrated a strong Canadian approach to environmental governance, building on the success of the roundtable approach established by the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. The resulting Canadian climate change plan covered most sectors of the economy, which would have an impact on GHG emissions and also which had potential to curtail them. These sectors included transportation, housing and commercial buildings, large industrial emitters, including power generation, oil and gas production and refining, cement manufacture, mining and smelting, the renewable energy and cleaner fossil fuel sectors, small and medium-sized enterprises, and agriculture, forestry, and landfills. The plan also covered all regions of Canada with an effort to focus on the most useful contributions each region, each province, each territory could make to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in a way that balanced costs and benefits across the country. The outcome was a national climate change plan. What I mean by this is that it was a robust plan which covered virtually every energy producing, that is every supply sector in the economy, and every energy using, that is demand sector of the economy. The plan included and was based on a strong set of governance principles that had been negotiated by ministers at the federal provincial table. A made in Canada approach, phased implementation, balancing reductions against competitiveness costs, an equitable sharing of burdens across each region and the respect for jurisdictional responsibilities and authorities, and a comprehensive across the Canadian economy and society approach which promoted innovation. It was a substantive plan with a range of policy instruments well along in design and largely ready for implementation on a sector by sector basis. These plans included aggressive targets for emission reductions within each sector targeted policy measures to be applied, for example, regulations and the application of market-based policies, including the setting of a carbon price and the introduction of a cap-and-trade system for emissions reductions. It was designed to be effective based on a number of critical factors. The first is that the key stakeholders in each sector had been part of the process of the plan development. The necessary economic impact analysis both at the national and at the regional levels, and also at the macro and micro levels had been done. The science was understood, and in 2002 was sufficiently agreed upon and had sufficient confidence among all key stakeholders, including the key industrial sectors. That said, there were legitimate and opposing views and counter-analysis which demonstrated that the plan could not meet all of the target that Canada had established under the Kyoto Protocol, in the end, the plan failed, however. It was not adopted nationally because of political reasons. Distrust and disagreement between the federal and provincial jurisdictions ultimately undermined the plan. But the plan was implemented as a federal plan, although only in part. One additional critical factor was ultimately missing. An internationally established price for carbon. 
which had been as estimated in the plan at a range of $15 through to $50 per ton, but was never materialized, never put in place. So we were almost there. Canada was very close to putting in place a national climate change action plan with policy measures agreed for most sectors and by most provinces. This demonstrates a lost opportunity in leadership which we've never recovered and today we're not even close to having a national plan on climate change. In fact, if we look today, where are we? Well, the government has pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. A recent report by the Federal Commissioner for Environment and Sustainable Development, Scott Vaughan, has shown that the current measures in place by the federal government for a much lower emission reduction target of 17% reduction over 2005 by the year 2020 is also not on track. Based on the results, the Commissioner concluded that federal government's simple sector-by-sector -sector regulation approach is not sufficient and may not get us even 50% of the way to the new lower target. But national governance for climate change is not just a matter of targets. It's about policy instruments. Which policy instruments? Which cho choice on policy instruments? Those which are used to make progress across the economy and the robustness of the suite of instruments that are used to achieve these targets. Earlier this year, I did a short comparative study of the measures other countries have put in place to act on their GHG reduction commitments, whether they are Kyoto Protocol commitments or the voluntary commitments under the 2010 Copenhagen Accord. By contrast to Canada, which is focusing on one instrument, one instrument, a regulation, and on a very narrow set of sectors, my study concluded that countries that are on track to meet their GHG reduction targets use a robust policy base with a variety of policy instruments, regulatory, market-based and incentives, and voluntary measures. Most countries are well ahead of Canada in their efforts. Even the United States, which relies largely on a regulatory approach, which Canada is following, has broader national incentives for clean energy, R&D, and deployment. In Australia, national policy relies on economy-wide market instruments complemented by incentives for renewable energy research and land management. Today, we are seeing a serious weakening of national environmental law through Act C-38, passed in the spring of 2012. This was part of a budget omnibus bill which changed not only environmental law, but tax law, immigration law, fundamentally, and at a stroke of a pen. The federal government has now put in place a suite of changes to federal environmental legislation as part of this act and a new act introduced in the fall of 2002, which changed a number of acts, including the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, substantive changes to the Fisheries Act, Navigable Waters Protection Act, and also changes to the Species at Risk Act. Four out of the five major pieces of environmental legislation the main features across these amendments and changes to federal na national environmental law are first, the federal government vacating formerly held national regulatory jurisdiction or seriously limiting its application. Second, very substantial increase in ministerial discretion on application of these laws with respect, for example, to the ability to exclude projects from environmental laws and areas of land and water from regulatory requirements and a major delegation of responsibilities to provinces and territories for the carrying out of environmental assessments and for environmental regulation. This is being accompanied by attempts to drive the wedge between the environment and the economy and by vilifying environmental critics and casting nature as an obstacle to development. This said, there are useful improvements. For example, the Canadian environmental assessment process, at least on paper, will help focus effort of environmental assessments on most significant projects. Implementation requirements are still to be put in place to determine whether this will be the case. But most significant is the weakening of the Fisheries Act, Canada's strongest piece of environmental legislation. There was indeed a need to improve the Act. It was being implemented in a very cumbersome and inefficient way. For example, requirements for uh, issuance of permits for very minor habitat disturbances for example, culverts and farmers' fields really were not serving the environmental interests of Canada and certainly causing the economy and certain stakeholders a lot of effort. But this could have been done, these measures could have been changed through improvement to the management and implementation of the existing Fisheries Act rather than through a wholesale amendment to the Act. The new Fisheries Act significantly changes federal authority to set regulation regarding activities which affect important fish habitat, 
which are defined as harmful alterations, disruptions, or destruction of habitat, now restricted only to a set of defined relevant fish. These are defined as fish in a commercial, aboriginal, or recreational fishery, whereas previously it was all fish and all aquatic species, including shellfish, crustaceans, and marine mammals, regardless of the use of these by humans. This provides the opportunity to undermine protection of important freshwater ecosystems, and it reduces the numbers and types of habitats which are subject to regulatory approval for projects that affect them. And the Navigable Waters Protection Act, the other major piece of federal legislation on environment and in the waterways, is now restricted to 97 lakes and 62 rivers across Canada, severely limiting which kinds of projects and constructions are subject to federal regulation in these waterways. But it's not always been that way. If we look back to 1991, late 1980s into 1991, when Canada and the United States signed the U.S.-Canada Acid Rain Treaty, it was a different situation. Acid rain being one of the examples, the science of acid rain was quite understood. And thanks to Dr. Schindler and others, uh, we knew what the point sources were as well. And there were off-the-shelf technologies for scrubbing SO2 from stacks that with government regulation, we were able to put that forward and, and simply clean up emissions point sources. To what is said in the video, I would add that a key element of environmental governance that was at play in the case of the acid rain situation was the demonstration of political leadership. Prime Minister Mulroney grasped the importance of acid rain as a national issue. He had his officials set out strong federal regulation to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions. He convinced the provinces, Ontario in particular, to regulate their coal-fired generating stations and the nickel smelting industries. And he convinced the US President Ronald Reagan to sign the treaty. And interestingly, these measures not only led to environmental improvements, but they actually led to innovation in the metal smelting companies, Inco and Falconbridge in Sudbury, who previously had tried to solve the problem by raising the smokestacks, which only spread the damage further, led them to make major improvements in their processes for industrial smelting of nickel, with the result of not only innovation, but reduced smelting costs. Now I'd like to turn more broadly to another approach to addressing environmental issues through government. And while we have no national policy on climate and we have a weakening of national environmental laws in most instances, there is an example through a short history which I'd like to give you where federal government's attempt to regulate air quality together with provinces is making a difference. In 2006, the then federal environment minister set out an approach to regulate air quality directly at the local level but through federal regulation, through national law. He called this approach tough tougher, the toughest, intending to regulate industries contributing to the air pollution. Simultaneously at the bureaucratic level, senior officials in Ottawa stood firm on the long-held federal right, or thought of as right and necessity to regulate air quality directly. But air quality cannot be regulated from the top down, at least not directly. It is a local issue. It has to be managed at the airshed level. To overturn this approach, an unusual coalition of Canadian industry and NGOs came together, including chemicals industry, electricity generation industry, and a range of environmental groups, who recognized that such a top-down approach would not work. This informal coalition put forward a model whereby federal and provincial governments' respective authorities and capacities to regulate air quality would be put together in a more logical way. The result was the National Air Quality Management System announced in October 2012. It comprises national standards which set a bar for outdoor air quality management across the country, ensuring the need to have a safe level of air quality to protect human health and the environment, and in particular from two pollutants, fine particulate matter and ground level ozone, the two main components of smog. Second element was national industrial emission requirements to set a base level of performance for major air polluting industries. The third is regulation through airshed management within and by the provinces that enables action tailored to specific sources of air emissions in a given area and addresses the particular air quality issues of each airshed. And finally, compliance and enforcement responsibilities carried out by each province and territory, not by the federal government. 
I call this approach environmental federalism, an approach to environmental management in Canada which recognizes the respective authorities as well as the strengths of the players in the federation, with federal responsibility for national standard setting, and provincial responsibility for setting policy, making decisions on land use and resource planning, and most importantly, regulatory decision making on environmental protection. But I think it's important to move beyond just the role of government, particularly as in many instances we're seeing failures in the role of government in environmental governance. So domestic law and policy is only one means of achieving environmental governance. Strong environmental governance is needed across all sectors of society, ensuring that industry and civil society groups, as well as governments at all levels, take the right decisions to protect the environment. These broader forms of environmental governance include, at the international level, soft law in the form of international norms and standards, and at both the international and national levels, an increasing role for new actors in environmental governance, particularly the private sector, industry, businesses, both individually and acting in concert together through industry associations, and civil society, defined as the role of communities and NGOs taking action to their own hands or working cooperatively either with industry or government to find innovative new approaches. This lecture does not have time to address some very interesting approaches that have emerged in the last 10 to 15 years, international soft law and national and international certification schemes are very important and I'll provide a short introduction to each. One example of soft law which has been emerging over time is through the International Finance Corporation the private sector lending arm of the World Bank. The IFC has put in place a set of performance standards on environmental and social sustainability, covering broad range of environmental and social domains, all of which require proper management and protection for effective projects. These standards are performance-based. They focus on company actions at least at the project planning stage and intended to be carried through to project construction and implementation. They're designed largely for due diligence purposes. In other words, to enable the IFC as a lender, as a governmental lender, intergovernmental lender, and also private investors to have confidence that the environmental social issues that are addressed by the companies they're lending to in international projects are properly treated. Interestingly, private banks are increasingly adopting these standards even though they've been fashioned through an intergovernmental process and they are now being used to raise the bar on environmental and social performance in the private sector through their investments in developing countries. The other major area of environmental governance that has been emerging over the last 10 to 15 years are environmental and social performance certification schemes. And the best known of these is the Forest Stewardship Council. Originally developed through a small collaboration between the World Wildlife Fund and a number of forest products companies in the early 1990s, its unique governance structure at the time involving NGOs and industry has now evolved to address broader social interests, including indigenous peoples. It functions through an international governance body made up of these interests. It sets international standards for responsible forest management and it accredits third-party organizations to certify forest managers and forest product producers to test that they meet the requirements of the FSC standards. The FSC label provides recognition to forest products companies which support and adhere to these standards, provides market recognition to them, it allows consumers to recognize that products that are produced under these sustainable forest management certification schemes are in fact sustainable at the forest level and they've been largely applied by large buyers of forest products such as home products companies and big publishing firms but driven largely by NGOs to adopt these. There is a much broader set of certification schemes covering many domains including natural medicines and cosmetics, food products, clothing and footwear and commodities such as palm oil and gold and these would warrant a separate set of lectures to explore in more detail their functioning and how effective they have been. Another direction, another mode for more innovative environmental governance has been industry-led initiatives, 
what I call industry voluntary initiatives, sometimes called industry self-regulation, where governments have been increasingly failing to effectively put in place policy and law to address societal concerns on environment and social issues, industry has stepped in to take up the gauntlet, recognizing not only that there is a gap in regulation, but they clearly have understood the need to build and in some cases rebuild the reputation by demonstrating social and environmental responsibility. So in Canada, some industries, not all, but some major industries, particularly in the resource sectors and to some extent in the manufacturing sectors and the retail sector, have been innovators in industry voluntary initiatives to improve environmental and social performance. Broadly, these can be defined as industry voluntary action, being cooperation across a group of willing companies, often through a trade or industry association with member companies who work together to address common issues of concern to society and which affect the industry reputation. The drivers for such voluntary action is very simple and can be demonstrated in this simple equation. Reputation is equal to demonstrated performance improvement by the industry plus credible and balanced communication and all importantly strong relationships which underlie the programs to improve and demonstrate performance improvements. And I have two examples that I'd like to give. First is the longest standing industry voluntary initiative on environment and social performance in the world, Responsible Care, put in place by the chemical industry in Canada. In the mid-1980s, the chemical industry was in big trouble. It had suffered major disasters such as the Union Carbide Bhopal chemical factory explosion and in Canada, companies such as Dow, DuPont and Esso were polluting the St. Clair River. The industry got its act together put together its own program to improve its environmental performance and community relations. And thus was born Responsible Care. What made this unique was first of all the member company commitment to an ethic of behavior and performance expressed in a set of principles for each of the members of the chemical industry to improve on their own and to meet a certain standard. Second, the program required every member of the industry to put in place a management system and practices which follow a set of codes of industry practice, which were moving practice well beyond regulatory requirements. Third, each company and each of its facilities had to be verified by a team of industry and community verifiers to check the company's claims of performance against these codes. With the verification reports made public, the performance results made public, and all overseen by a national stakeholder panel to the chemical industry. And finally, at the local level, community advisory panels between each company and each facility were established with the local community as a means of communication and problem resolution. And finally, all of these were conditions of membership in the associations. Companies had to adhere to all of these conditions or they could be thrown out, and in fact, in the chemical industry, it did happen. This Canadian model has now been taken up in over 40 countries, though the Canadian Responsible Care Program is considered the most rigorous. And interestingly, it's been taken up by a number of other industries. Uh, first and foremost, the mining industry in Canada, who's developed a similar performance-based program on, called Towards Sustainable Mining. And more recently, the pipeline industry is in the process of developing its own program called Integrity First. Let me just give one example of this type of architecture for a robust environmental and social performance program on a voluntary basis, that of the Industry Association for Mining, Mining Association of Canada. The program is based around a set of guiding principles. Each year, companies measure their performance based on a set of standards outlined by the program. It's a way of, uh, of demonstrating to the public and to our key communities of interests or stakeholders that we are operating responsibly and that we are striving towards sort of continuous improvement. The Mining Association of Canada launched the Towards Sustainable Mining Initiative following a series of accidents related to Canadian mining companies in the late 1990s. Because of the tailings dam failures uh, and the other concerns, there was a sense that we were not meeting the expectations of Canadians, and particularly NGOs and critics and the regulators. Uh, and, but they wanted us to succeed as an industry. 
And so out of that came the recommendations that really led to the development of towards sustainable mining. The program started with the issue of tailings management, then expanded to cover other key issues, like energy use and greenhouse gas emissions management, external outreach to the communities in which companies work, and crisis management planning. We drill down quite deep in terms of the kinds of measures and requirements that companies are supposed to have in place to say that they're, they're operating responsibly or that they're good performers. That accountability and transparency and commitment to performance improvement is what was at the core key of building trust again in the industry. But even this voluntary effort, all of these voluntary efforts, are not sufficient to address the challenges that Canadian society is facing in terms of environmental governance. So what has been emerging more broadly in the last few years are what I define as collaborative efforts. Organizations, often strange bedfellows, working together to a common purpose across multiple sectors or interests to create solutions beyond that which they could accomplish alone. True collaboration. And I have three examples. One among competing oil and gas companies on environmental technology. One involving a negotiated truce in the forests, involving the forest industry and NGOs who were boycotting that industry, and last, involving a coalition of First Nations and governments. But first, I just want to acknowledge another model with a long-standing history in Canada, that of the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. National Roundtable was a typical Canadian way of informing and formulating public policy, based on the recognition that environment and economy are intimately linked, and that the only way to address major environmental problems is by bringing major interests and stakeholders together to provide creative solutions. Established in 1993, it brought together representatives of key interests, NGOs, academics, industry, community representatives to work together to undertake policy research independent from government, but clearly to inform government. It addressed such critical issues as the policy measures needed to address climate change, and how to manage Canada's natural capital, and it developed a set of new macroeconomic indicators to add to the GDP to bring in environmental and social performance and progress in Canada. A number of past Prime Ministers such as Brian Mulroney and also Finance Ministers such as Paul Martin valued its advice and in fact acted on its policy. But as you can see, the current Prime Minister has decided to abolish it because the National Roundtable, this innovative mechanism, was apparently producing unwanted and inconvenient advice. Now I will turn to an industry collaborative effort. In the oil sense, a region under heavy development pressure and scrutiny, and with an industry under serious threat for its environmental performance record. Four years ago, 2008, Six like-minded oil sands companies came together in what was called the Oil Sands Leadership Initiative to work collaboratively to improve their environmental and social performance in the lower Athabasca River oil sands region. They put in place a number of measures, restoring land through innovative tree planting methods, reducing water use through sharing best practices across companies, and also on the social side, establishing youth-based programs in First Nations and Métis communities to keep kids in school. But there were only a few players with a very large environmental and social set of issues to solve in the oil sands region. So earlier this year, in 2012, a very unusual collaboration among 12 competing oil sands companies, having a wide range of corporate cultures, from Imperial Oil to Suncor to the Norwegian Statoil, created an organization called Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. What is interesting about this consortium is the agreement among these fierce competitors to recognize the need to act together to go beyond regulation to improve environmental performance seriously in the oil sands. And what is more remarkable is that given the oil industry company's strong hold on IP, intellectual property, and their past unwillingness to share technologies, the agreement under this COSIA to share environmental technologies across the 12 companies is really a major step forward. Its purpose is to drive accelerated improvement in environmental performance across four areas, tailings management and reclamation, water use and management, land stewardship, and the management of greenhouse gas emissions.
It is too early to see the environmental results. They are still in the process as an organization of establishing their goals, environmental performance goals. But let's see how ambitious these goals will be as a measure to determine whether, in fact, this initiative has potential. Another even more bold example of unusual partners is the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement. A very different approach. Crisis driven by the loss of European and US markets by the Canadian forest products producers and by NGOs who had a strong commitment to protection of the boreal forest, having established a 50% protection target for all of Canada in the boreal forest, who were frustrated by the lack of action by governments. So the two sides, the forest industry and Canadian environmental NGOs, agreed to sit at the table with each other, with their enemies. Ultimately, 21 members of the Forest Products Association of Canada and eight national environmental NGOs were involved over two years to negotiate a deal. And the deal was simple in its construct. Protection of key habitat in the boreal forest was traded for stopping forest product boycotts. But the deal was complicated in its commitments. And the objectives of the legal agreement that was a result of this negotiation process addressed six elements. World-leading on-the-ground sustainable forest management practices to be adopted by the entire industry using third-party certification completion of a network of protected areas that taken as a whole would represent the diversity of the ecosystems within the boreal region of Canada, the recovery of critical species at risk, starting with the woodland caribou, reducing greenhouse gas emissions through the full life cycle of the forest industry, improved prosperity of the forest sector including the communities that depend upon it, and recognition by the marketplace, that is the customers, the investors, the consumers of forest products that the agreement made under the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement in fact demonstrates best practice in environmental protection. What made the deal possible is that the companies in Canada hold forest tenures. That is, they have the right to manage and directly hold land large blocks of forests over long periods of time, 20 to 50 years. It is this long-term right to manage the least forest blocks which allowed the forest companies to have something to bring to the table as their part of the bargain. Interestingly, both sides have kept to their broad commitments after two years of work. However, progress is slow, at least against the very ambitious targets for both forest protection and forest industry health that were laid out in the agreement. And one of the reasons for this was an important weakness in the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement. The negotiation process excluded two key interests, the actual owners of the land. Aboriginal communities who exercise traditional use of the land, that is under lease to forest companies, and under the Canadian Constitution, provincial governments who own the resource and provide the companies with the leases. Now some of the environmental Aboriginal communities and government involved at the provincial level have come on board. Others are still concerned with having been left out of the process. Finally, one last feature, which is increasingly being seen in environmental governance processes in Canada, is a role of third parties. In this case, two private foundations with strong environmental programs. The US-based Pew Foundation and the Canadian Ivy Foundation. In the case of the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement, they brought the industry and NGO parties together to the table by creating a safe place for dialogue and ultimately a, a level of comfort for the necessary negotiations. They also provided funding for the two-year period of negotiation. Finally, one last innovative example. I'd like to speak about one involving First Nations and federal and provincial governments in Canada. This is the Pemachuan Aki World Heritage Site application in northwestern Ontario and eastern Manitoba. This is the first of its kind, protecting a large swath of boreal forest for both natural heritage values and cultural values. There are several interesting governance aspects to this uh, heritage application which hopefully will be adopted in 2013 by the World Heritage Convention. First of all, five Aishinaibe First Nations in northwestern Ontario and eastern Manitoba came together under what they called the First Nations Accord to work together on the plan. They were the initiators. Community land use planning exercises under provincial jurisdiction involving each of the First Nations, allowed them to set out traditional lands well beyond the reserves, mainly on the basis of trap lines, 
and traditional use of land, and enabled each community to both articulate their vision for their land and to map out and allocate land for different purposes according to the community vision. So some communities decided on maintaining all their land for traditional resource and spiritual use and for ecotourism, while others included parts of the land for sustainable forest operations. Importantly, both provincial governments, Manitoba and Ontario, approved the land use plans in these five communities, effectively giving surface ownership rights to the First Nations on the basis of the map traditional land uses. This has provided the former native reserves, these communities with very small areas of land, a much larger piece of land and resources in which they have the authority to manage and use. And they've achieved this right of resource use through a process which was much lighter and easier than the difficult negotiation of land claims with the federal and provincial governments that takes place in other parts of the country. If the World Heritage Site application is approved at the international level, it will be on the condition of there being no exploitation of subsurface mineral resources. Therefore, the agreements will also, and the status will also effectively bind subsurface rights as well. A final feature of this innovative example of environmental governance is the role of the governments, Manitoba, Ontario, and Canada, through their parks agencies, bringing to the table as part of the land to be covered under the World Heritage Site existing national and provincial parks alongside the mapped out lands of the First Nations. I now would like to move to international environmental governance. And let me use this series of Rio conferences on environment and development to map out intergovernmental commitments and processes on environment and sustainable development. In 1992, the Earth Summit, what was known as the UN Summit on Environment and Development, or just the Rio summit, was held in Brazil. There were real and substantive outcomes reached by the over 170 countries that had heads of state at that summit. There was a real declaration containing a set of very strong principles that have served environmental law development at the international and national level ever since. There was Agenda 21, a large and important action plan covering most areas of environment and sustainable development, as a guide, as a roadmap for countries to follow at the national level, and two substantive multilateral environmental agreements, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change were both signed by many countries and soon came into force after the conference. If we go 10 years later, in 2002, a follow-up conference called the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg had only minor outcomes maybe not surprisingly given the major commitments made only 10 years earlier. The Johannesburg Conference was largely about reporting by governments on progress made to date, but interestingly, business and civil society, communities, NGOs were reporting on the progress they had made. The overall picture in terms of progress on Agenda 21 was mixed, but the highlight was the role that other sectors of society, other agents of environmental governance were starting to play increasingly. If we move to this year, 2012, the last of the series of the Rio conferences called Rio Plus 20, the result was a very weak document titled The Future We Want. Not what we agree to as governments, not what we commit to do, but simply we would like to see as governments of the world. All of this, I'm afraid, does not bode well for the future of international environmental negotiations. And in my view, there's not much to be gained in further negotiation of new commitments through multilateral environmental agreements. Reaching consensus is increasingly difficult on sustainable development issues at the international level and in these international forums and processes. In fact, many would say no longer possible for a number of reasons, including too many agendas and trade-offs across issues in the international system, environmental objectives being traded off against other international and national objectives. Environmental negotiations have largely been taken over by professional negotiations, not the experts who led the negotiation of the environmental agreements. Key interests from NGOs to indigenous peoples to industry are being further and further pushed away from the real negotiations and are having little input on negotiating positions. And finally, narrow national interests are blocking government's willingness to make international agreements and commitments when they convene in international fora. The political protectionism by national governments. Governments are unwilling to give up sovereignty or authority to some higher authority or a broader agreement. 
they're concerned at protecting what they see as national interests. Sometimes the national interest is a special interest within their country that for some reason they've chosen to protect. And so they're reluctant to agree to something that might be for the good of all if it gives up a little bit of something that they consider to be precious. Nonetheless, the Convention on Biological Diversity is perhaps one of the conventions that is making some progress through recent negotiations. In 2011 in Nagoya, at the meeting of the Conference of Parties, it established a strategic plan with specific biodiversity targets called the HE targets to address key areas of biodiversity conservation and the sustainable use of natural resources. However, implementation is by no means assured. And I think it's clear to all that the negotiations of the Conference of the Parties on the UN Convention on Climate Change, very little progress appears possible on major environmental commitments. And I would say for a number of reasons. North-South ideological split over the real principle on common but differentiated responsibility. Lack or failure of national policies in climate change leading to stalling negotiating positions by some parties, and more broadly a view expressed in a recent paper by Heike Schroeder, Maxwell Boykoff, and Laura Spears that the consensus-based decision-making used by United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change stifles progress and contributes to negotiating deadlock. The structures and processes are antiquated, unfair, and obstruct attempts to reach agreement. International environmental negotiations on new commitments are not the way forward where I believe action needs to and will shift to on environmental, international environmental governance is the following. Using environmental conventions and conferences to focus on implementation of existing commitments which are woefully behind in terms of progress rather than making new commitments. The use of regional and bilateral forms and agreements negotiated outside of the UN where progress can be made. And new partnerships, outsider governments, involving civil society and business to act on the commitments already made by their countries under the conventions. And finally, new ways of negotiating, bringing governments and other interests together to the table to do the negotiations, rather than governments negotiating between themselves. One example is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And I would highlight its innovative governance structure where governments and NGOs at the international and national level, where states and government agencies, all members of IUCN, covering over 138 countries of the world. And when they come together, all decisions taken by the IUCN involve equal power, equal votes by the government and non-governmental parts of the union. So, to wrap up, where are we heading? Here are a couple of views from a recent seminar held on public participation in environmental governance. A lot of the environmental issues that we're dealing with now, be it climate change, biodiversity, they are more complex problems than we've dealt with in the past. And I think we have to be very careful about not thinking the same solutions that worked in the past will see us through these problems in the future. I, I think we'll need something, we'll need a different sort of process and a different sort of set of tools that acknowledge the system's complexity with, of these issues and the level to which solving these issues is integrated into every aspect of the economy. But beyond this, I would say that there is a need for governments to reclaim the critical role they play in environmental governance. To start again to accept the responsibilities of key actors although by no means the only actors, but to pick up their responsibilities for environmental governance, including the recognition that strong but efficient environmental law and regulation is good for all of society, including business interests and communities. And that governments need to begin once again to work with and draw on the knowledge and essential support of other key sectors in society in formulating environmental policy and law. Other orders of government, including Aboriginal groups, need to be included, as do business, NGOs, and communities. For its part, industry needs to continue to implement substantive, voluntary programs which move well beyond regulatory compliance to address both ecosystem and community needs. But putting in place the necessary safeguards to ensure that real progress is being made and that we avoid greenwashing or minimalist action by industry working through self-regulation. This will be aided by key involvement of external stakeholders including critics of the industry, 
true transparency measures to bring to light the behaviors and the good and bad performance of the industry and the companies themselves, and use of solid third-party review or verification practices to ensure that what industry commits to is in fact being acted upon. NGOs, for their part, also need to work more to find common solutions with industry that allow buy-in to each other's environmental objectives where there is common ground and mutually beneficial ground while not giving up their role in helping hold industry and governments to account for the commitments they have made. And finally, there is a need to develop and put in place new forms of multi-interest environmental governance, those that involve shared decision-making and clear accountabilities across all interests, governments, Aboriginal groups, industry, NGOs and communities, building on some of the best case examples that we have had in place in Canada and internationally. Thank you very much.